I think that the macro geopolitics are influencing very much the way the investment community right now is thinking about risk. When you look at the startup space, uh, is it more on the application side that you see the investments coming in? Hi, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the second episode of Deep Dive with NASCOM. Uh, today we are going to talk about a little more into the regulation of AI. I know it has been talked about a lot, but what we're going to do is that we are, we are going to talk to Justin. Uh, Justin, he is the Associate General Counsel at Process. And, and what I like about uh, when I talk about uh, talk with Justin is that he represents uh, the largest tech investor, one of the largest tech investors into uh, into the space. And, and therefore, when he's talking, it's not just bringing in his experience from um, data from intellectual property rights and competition perspective, but also the fact that he represents the investor community. So it's really interesting to get his perspective. And uh, Justin, uh, we did a episode um, a few days back where we were talking about AI. And there uh, the conversation really started uh, from uh, the fact that, you know, how nations decide their strategies can actually um, determine uh, um, uh, whether it's uh, going to be a competitive advantage for them or otherwise, uh, right? And 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 therefore um, uh, that's one thing that came up. And but before we get into the regulation, uh, I was looking at this um, um, Stanford's AI index report, and interesting data. You know, uh, ten years if you look look back, India got investment of about seven and a half billion dollars, and and when I look at the last year's number. Roughly half of that um, is uh, uh, equivalent of that is coming in the last year. So obviously, uh, in US, when you look at China and UK, they are way ahead. But if you compare to Israel, we are pretty much there in AI in investments. And I'm talking about private investments. So when you're looking at um, India as a place in terms of AI investment, uh, what's your outlook? I mean, uh, and, and what are the, some of the things that you are observing uh, your, your take? Yeah, sure. I Look, I think that there are three trends that are really interesting to me right now. Just speaking in my personal capacity, as I, as I read some of the articles that you've been talking about and hearing from my colleagues, I, I think that the first macro trend or the thing that many, many executives are focusing on right now are the geopolitics questions. So we know that US, China, both major AI powerhouses are having increasing tensions. People are focused on technology disruption that might come from uh, possible conflicts in the South China Sea or around the Strait of Taiwan. I think that the macro geopolitics are influencing very much the way the investment community right now is thinking about risk. And risk tolerance <laughs> uh, changes uh, depending on whether you, you are backing a very uh, well-funded, uh, fairly mature organization, or whether you are targeting more startups. And I think that that risk tolerance can cut in both directions. From, from one perspective, you might think that big players and big nations are best positioned to manage risks if something goes wrong. But you might also find that those very big institutions are a little bit more um, wary of taking on too much risk, particularly given if we're talking about the AI space, some of the ambiguity about uh, AI liability and who's responsible for what. So you might actually see the inverse, that there's opportunity for small, you know, VC-backed startups that may be able to take a lot of risk because they know, okay, if something really bad happens, then the whole thing goes away, but the level of investment was much smaller. So strategically, if you know you're in a very volatile geo political environment, you might see a trend toward the two extremes, risk taking um, with, with small investments versus, you know, doubling down and consolidation in very big players because you feel they have the pockets to absorb big changes or shocks or impacts that, that may come. Um, I'm also quite interested in, so another theme is supply chains in general. And the B2B space, you know, when we read articles like Apple it, trying to diversify some of its technology investments away from an over-concentration in only one jurisdiction, I think India and Singapore are maybe the recent beneficiaries of that trend. Um, I think that that's equally relevant for investments in AI, particularly given the dependence of major AI systems on data labeling 
data tagging for the past several years, I think it was three or four years ago, we started hearing about the rise of these data labeling companies, many of which, even if based in the US, are outsourcing to India for resources to help feed an Apple or a Google or a Microsoft product. And I think that that integration is very interesting from a from an investment perspective, I, the cover of Forbes magazine recently, you may have seen had Alexander Wang, who's the CEO of Scale AI, you know, a self-made billionaire now. Um, but this, but this tagging industry is is really big, big business, and these support AI support businesses, the B two B for major players, I think have a lot of distribution outside potentially outside the United States. And you mentioned Israel. Israel's another jurisdiction that has a lot of B2B technology capability in the same way that I think India does. So that's that's the space that I'm very interested in as we see these chatbots and these internal HR aids start to build on generative AI developments and people looking for business models. Yes, they can get money because of growth, but they have to be able to have a business model. And I think the B2B business models are the soonest to market. So we should keep our eye on that, I'd say. I guess um, I, you're right, absolutely. And 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 in this risk reward ratio kind of a equation, uh, obviously, you know, a lot of global capability centers in India are already doing a lot of the work, the kind of work that you talked about in when it in, comes to AI. Um, but when you look at the startup space, uh, uh, is it more on the application side that you see the investments coming in, or do you also see uh, uh, as standalone companies into research? And development, uh, do you see that as a space that uh, that could be potential uh, investment into India, and and particularly looking at India's regulatory position overall? Uh, uh, just get your thoughts on that. Also, a lot of changes happening uh, from AI perspective. Uh, what are your initial thoughts uh, as to what you are seeing in India uh, from a regulatory space also? From a regulatory perspective as well. Well, you know, I think I read the same article that you did that was talking about the ranking of investments right now. And we saw India in position where it was. But in that article, if I remember, they mentioned uh, a Chennai based company, Unifor, which you may know that raised, was it 400 million, I think? With a two billion valuation, I, I don't know how how well the viewers uh, are familiar with this company, but you know that certainly signals signals, you know, a, a potential domain that investors are are willing to look at. You know, for sure. Look, I think broadly speaking, it is true that with the macro economy the way it is, access to capital has become much tighter, and valuations have been shifting really significantly, and even deep pocket investors that had a lot of cash on the books that were spending a lot of money started to pull back a little bit and be more conservative about their investments, certainly for the past year or so uh, in light of what's been happening with inflation and, and a lot of macroeconomic trends. So I think that um, things are starting to uh, return in terms of an interest in AI investments, maybe at a small level, you know, minority investments in, in some earlier stages, along with the risk profile that, that we were talking about earlier. I think that, you know, when you ask about Indian regulation, we we know that uh, the Indian government has, has, I think, been very consistent in, in wanting to support domestic, the possibility of growing domestic champions. Right, and this debate, whether we're talking the Digital India Act, which I know you, you you can tell tell me a lot more about, and I'm interested to hear more about it. But even just from a broad technology regulation perspective, this debate about ex ante regulation versus ex post regulation, the generic term that we're using to talk about competition uh, commission uh, work or or others, I do think that uh, India has been somewhat restrained. On, uh, on the ex anti regulation front, and that has been helpful to a general global investor perspective that this is a pretty favorable environment for early stage investing. Uh, you know, at this at this time, it does help manage the risk in a way. You know, if you're concerned that a young company may not have the capabilities to fully comply with a very mature, advanced uh, regulation, whatever the technology regulation domain. We know that those environments, I think, from our experience in Europe and the U.S., tend to, the ex-anti-regulation environments tend to favor the incumbents. 
the big players that are already there that have big teams and have big resources to absorb these, these kinds of regulations. And it makes it tricky for the long tail of startups and, and the smaller players. So I, I would say in general that India has been pretty hospitable to this distributed investment you know, model and think international investors are just as interested in national champions. Yeah, no, Justin, uh, I, I think I'll go a step further. I'll actually say that now, uh, if you look at the journey India had on the data protection bill, right, and we have seen that over the last five years and, and where it's now shaping up, I think there's a clear understanding that we are we are now shifting away from a very EU-style uh, regulation when it comes to uh, digital markets. And, and probably uh, that is at least my assessment that when you look at the Digital India Act, uh, we will uh, we will not necessarily reflect a very EU uh, style regulation. And similarly, when you look at our competition law, uh, uh, so you know that we are uh, looking at a, a digital uh, uh, competition bill, and 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 that's going to come up soon uh, in some sort of uh, consultation. But again, uh, uh, what is interesting, at least as per my understanding, is that it is not necessarily going into the uh, digital market. Uh, act style of regulation, and 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 I think that is what I think is interesting from an uh, AI regulation perspective. Also, what what we have been able to at least in our interactions both with the government and industry is to really talk about the opportunity in the AI space, and and to say that you know look, um, uh, uh, let's look at these uh, existing laws that we already have, and see that you know. Uh, where, uh, how do they enable AI and as well as where are these uh, possible uh, areas where we need to actually look at uh, these laws and say that, you know, something needs to be sorted out. So, and that conversation is happening in a very, uh, very constructive manner with the government. And, 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 and I think some of that will get reflected as we uh, kind of look at uh, our uh, legal framework in terms of existing laws, enabling AI, and also the enforcement of existing law getting fine-tuned to tackle potential harms arising out of AI, right? So, for sure, so, for sure. So, so that, I think, in my view, is a great approach. But when I look at US, and that's where probably I want to get your perspective, and, and we look at a lot in terms of, you know, uh, US uh, 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 regulations and, and even uh, uh, laws which are put up in some sort of, you know, for discussion. And one interesting analysis which you did is that, uh, in last 20, 25 years, so many laws and bills on emerging tech have come up for, you know, for some, uh, some, in some bill form and for discussion, but hardly anything got legislated. So, so this obviously brings in a lot of discussion onto the table and, and a lot of things happens. But then you have the FTC, which at some level says that we'll take care of stuff. You don't need a law uh, or a new law. Uh, we, we are empowered. We have enough uh, regulatory back. So when you look at the uh, US uh, uh, position uh, when it comes to AI regulation and when you contrast this with, let's say, what the EU approach is and what the Indian approach is, do you clearly see this more as uh, as aligned to the national incentives or, uh, or or do you also see that there's a particular approach which at a principal level you think will work better, uh, which can be probably something where uh, uh, things will converge or potentially should converge at a global level uh, yeah. or these are just very different uh, incentive-led uh, regulatory approaches? I think um, you you raised a lot of really interesting bits that we could pick up. But if I'm trying to think structurally about the landscape, the regulatory landscape outside of India, I think we have to first think about the international instruments that we are seeing emerging and how they're relevant to those jurisdictions that matter on AI, for example. Um, then we can look at the US domestic context and then we can look at the European context. So let's not forget, on the international level, a lot of work has been happening on AI. We can call it maybe soft regulation, but principles-based um, guidelines. We, we have the OEC guidelines, which are, have been very influential. So influential, in fact, that the European Parliament's latest version changed the definitions to align with the OECD 
um, change the definition in the AI Act draft that they were amending. Thought that was very interesting. Sort of the rise of the OECD again as something relevant, uh, and that's important because both the U.S. and the EU are quite active within the OECD. We see the Council of Europe saying they want to do a convention on AI, and and we know that that sort of third party benchmark is potentially very influential in in Europe as well. We see what we might think of as self-regulatory or standard setting bodies, you know, when we think of ISO or NIST, really advancing in the absence of any formal regulation to create structures that a lot of companies are just starting to use to answer the question, how do we manage risk if there's no law and how do we develop sort of trusted systems? I think that those self-regulatory institutions are really stepping up in the way that they used to in the 1980s and the 1990s when it wasn't clear how even the internet was going to unfold. They really stepped forward. And, and I would say that the sort of the engineering technical community stood up and said, all right, let's give ourselves some structures that can later maybe be influential for regulation. All of those things are happening and we can't ignore them. We used to ignore them because the EU was jumping the gun and, and doing a lot of proactive regulation that had a lot of extraterritorial impact. But here with the AI Act, I think it's quite different for, for a few reasons. Number one, the extraterritorial reach of the AI Act is, as it's proposed, is very different than something like the GDPR. There, the AI Act is talking about deploying products in Europe not for the rest of the world. So for example, if you were a Dutch company that was building products that to be used by AI products to be used in India, maybe it's not subject to this AI Act thing, right? If it's So it's only when it's deployed. So that's much narrower. And you raise the question about sort of what is the effect or how should we read that in terms of competitiveness? Is that a disincentive to deploy products in Europe? And is Europe an important enough market to justify taking on all this liability and regulation and so forth? I think that that's a valid question. You know, you might be able to deploy for everywhere but Europe and still have a very scalable business, or maybe even a European company could deploy for the rest of the world and have a very stable business. So that's a that's an interesting twist as we see the jurisdiction piece in the AI Act. I, I think also, you know, if we look at the parliament in particular, since it's so recent, that's what everyone's talking about. The last parliament amendments that are trying to just set the stage for how early on how these foundation models, you know, for, for want of a better term, uh, might be regulated. We see them being bucketed with high-risk AI you know, they essentially give the same governance standards and requirements. In contrast, if we go to the United States, what you described, I think, is very true. FTC Commissioner Bedoya in April gave an excellent speech. I believe that, don't it's not a perfect quote, but essentially the message was AI is already regulated. And it's a myth that the FTC Act, with its deception and unfairness ability to go after companies that are engaging in AI practices that may harm consumers somehow, including bad bias issues or lack of transparency or lack of explainability, that those are actionable already under Section 5 of the FTC Act. And he gave a really robust and well-informed, sophisticated speech that I think reassured many people that the FTC is demonstrating, particularly at the commissioner level, sufficient expertise and understanding this was not a naive speech. This was a speech that gave very clear generative AI examples that he himself had done. And I think, I so I encourage everyone to go read that speech. It's not too long, but it's the best statement I've seen about why AI is already regulated in the United States. If we look at, excuse me, if we look at, um, the Congress, because you mentioned all of these bills that, that keep happening all over the place. Um, look, the most interesting to me is this recent discussion from Chuck Schumer, you know, who is the majority leader of, of the Senate, who in April said, look, China is getting ahead of us and we can't let that happen. So we need to come up with an AI regulatory framework. But back to my point about geopolitics, his first messages to try to get Republicans and Democrats together on legislation was that it had to be somehow focused on competitiveness with China. And I think that that message is very compatible with the FTC saying that its consumer protection authority may be sufficient on the consumer harm side, 
But Senator Schumer was really pointing a lot of attention to the fact that we needed expertise and research from a, almost a commerce and, a, and an international uh, intelligence perspective. And that seemed to be bringing Democrats and Republicans together ahead of an election cycle that will be very divisive and very difficult to pass any sort of, whether it's data privacy or AI regulation, whatnot. But things associated with competitiveness, uh, national security, these are more likely to drive consensus. And, you know, it may be frustrating for people outside the U.S. to see this long list of bills, you know, proposed over the years, and some of them you could essentially ignore uh, as not particularly relevant, and others that may be more, you know, more relevant. But I would, I'd encourage all of the observers to just pay very close attention uh, to who are the bill sponsors, are these bills being sponsored by someone who's on the committee that has jurisdiction from the political party that is in power of that particular branch? Those will help you create a short list of the ones to take a bit more seriously. And sometimes yeah, I, content goes I, I, somewhere else. But I, 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 take, I take your point, Justin, but if I were to take it with a pinch of salt, I would still say that um, uh, the likelihood of U.S. coming up with a standalone AI regulation kind of a legislation still seems very distant uh, 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 as against uh, EU, which has obviously moved in and is at a stage where it is in the final stages of uh, you know bringing it into some sort of implementation over the next uh, couple of years or so. Um, so definitely, I think one question that arises is that when we already say that you know there is there are all these laws and we can we can deal a lot uh, through these, uh, then uh, as a template, do most na nations uh, you know need to actually think about a standalone AI law? And India, for example, uh, uh, I think we are lucky we have something called the Information Technology Act, which is which kind of takes care of a lot of stuff which. Uh, regulates digital uh, economy and and probably if, if we are to think about you know what you need to do there in terms of regulating AI uh, obviously uh, uh, one one thing that we think about is important is to just users be aware that they are subjected to uh, autonomous or algorithmic decision making uh, and and then uh, and then them being able to exercise their rights. Uh, because once they know that they are subjected to this, they have they have already rights which they can deal with. Uh, the second set uh, of issues is a little more complex, and and I don't know whether uh, that debate will get settled down soon. But traditionally, as an intermediary, you have this safe harbor, uh, and 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 in AI systems, uh, that's not so obvious. So. Uh, so obviously we we are we are seeing uh, lawsuits happening across the world. At least some of them are there, uh, which are very visible. Uh, all this hallucination which AI can uh, cause these generative AI systems. So uh, I think that is one area which is a little tricky as to uh, because uh, it appears there are many many cooks when you think of this AI solution. Uh, 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 there is the developer, there is the user, and then there is backend data which is feeding into what the ai is processing and 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 giving as a result uh, but there at least uh, if we go down this route of saying that uh, the ai developer is open to all sorts of litigation uh, end to end then uh, we do have a situation where some of the early movers who grow up and scale up uh, and who are well funded and and have the resources can potentially tackle it and and for the newer uh, uh, startups which are which are now developing uh, because there is so much of awareness, then they probably will be more prone to this legal uh, cost and 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 the related uh, you know in a way a, a kind of a hurdle which they will need to cross. So I don't know. Uh, is this a serious debate uh, where uh, uh, we we can think of some kind of a midway where? You you can have some kind of a safe harbor, or 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 that's that's a really open question. Uh, Justin, have you thought about it? I have. Um, so one one thing that I think is useful is if you look at the Parliament's most recent amendments to the AI Act, they seem to have grappled with the idea that once uh, a general AI system like ChatGPT, you know, is packaged and given to many many different customers, that 
it might not be reasonable to hold the central entity responsible for everything that happens on the planet after that technology is being used. So they try to describe what they think might be required in order to justify a kind of a baton pass liability responsibility. So it, it, if you go and you read it, it, it gives a long list of things that the, that the um, general use AI provider must do to then have responsibilities for certain things transferred over to their clients or something like that. So I think that that's interesting because that's very recent, you know, recognition even in the regulated space of what that that might look like. So that that's one thing. I th I think the second thing is that if I think back to when the GDPR uh, first came out, we had exactly the same concern and all the same questions with such so many percent global turnover at stake. How could big clients ever agree to use small B2B companies or startups? And how could they negotiate even via contract what their indemnity would be if something went wrong? And in the beginning, companies in contract were asking for full indemnification of all of their, you know, two, four percent global turnover. And I remember asking law firms at that time, you know, what's the practice? And the answer was, there is no practice. We don't have any precedent for this. And what happened was it took, it took, you know, maybe a year of very difficult contract negotiations back and forth. And a lot of deals fell through till eventually they were, the market returned to indemnity clauses that were like, you know, you know, 1.5 times the value of the contract or, or something that made smaller players capable of negotiating and providing services. So my prediction is that it will be very similar, whether it's regulated or, you know, this it's feeling of unlimited liability that eventually needs to be negotiated in contract. Certain powerful players will try to seek full indemnification, but they know if they're working with a smaller player that has a technology that they need, smaller player can't afford to, to give full indemnification to a big player. And so there will be compromises there. So I think we will see that. The, the third real discussion, you know, I was teaching an AI law class uh, in the United States earlier uh, a month ago, and we had a big discussion about liability for the types of AI systems that really could hurt people, the ones that can kill people, the self-driving car. And we put on the board all the potential parties that might be responsible for something that bad that goes wrong and you know all of our desire to find one party to, to hold this on and one of the students said well won't it just be regulated by insurance just in the same way so the insurance company pays the claim and then the insurance company goes and finds all the different parties that may have been responsible and allocates responsibility jointly and severally among different players depending on their relative level of responsibility so that might be one prediction of how that gets sorted out over time when we have AI systems that especially have risks to human life or something like that. Um, you know, I wonder if if joint and several responsibility might emerge as something, particularly if the harms can be quantified in a very clear monetary way. Um, I, I think we might see that. So all of those ideas we should expect will will work themselves out, but there will be at least a year of uncertainty where everyone is very concerned about the lack of clarity on the question that you raise. But eventually, if you want to carry on with this, you have to work through those uncertainties and find yeah, solutions. I think, I, think, uh, I think you're right. And, and this is one area where we don't want the uh, regulations to outpace technology. Uh, I mean, you need to give that space for markets to kind of evolve and settle down at some level and then see if there is this strong uh, kind of asymmetry that that persists or or gaps which which remain unaddressed and i think that's uh, that's something uh, that probably at least we'll see play out and and obviously we'll have a lot of stuff to do in that journey um, and also uh, unlike traditional intermediaries these are not necessarily very public interface uh, in that sense, right? It's still one-to-one -one, uh, interaction, which is resulting in 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 in, in outputs, and 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 then obviously we are not talked about uh, uh, what it means in terms of intellectual property, uh, both in terms of the outputs that is generated and so on and so forth. And I don't know whether we'll have time for it, but but I think very quickly, huh? So let's let's see if we, if we can get a view uh, quickly on a topic as interesting as this, but. But generally, um, uh, the fact that uh, um, 
uh, we we observe, we assimilate a lot of stuff as humans, and then we create something. Uh, and 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 then obviously uh, inspiration is key to a lot of this stuff. So so and I looked at the uh, U.S. I think it was very interesting uh, guidance from the Copyright Office, which came out and and which I thought was very sensible in terms of applying the the existing copyright laws and saying that you know this is how it will work and and a lot of work that probably then needs to be done is just in terms of guidance to people to say that how existing laws apply and and to my earlier point you know uh, uh, and for industry to settle down and say that how much of it is just plain business level disruption which is happening rather than a significant regulatory gap uh, so uh, do you have a very uh, different take on this no, I agree with you. Look, the trend line on the IP question about IP creation seems to be consolidating around the fact that human needs to be involved and that the human is likely to be the one who will register the IP, right? And we've seen um, counter examples, I think in India and in South Africa and Canada, maybe there have been some jurisdictions that very quickly thought that they might you know, allow AI to register by itself in its own yeah. name. And then maybe revoke it after the fact when they think better of it. Um, and one of one of the IP advisors that we work with explained to me that you know different ju jurisdictions invest more or less time on the review process for those types of things. So it, we can explain why uh, an office might change its mind uh, subsequently when it receives feedback about a decision that it may have made rather quickly. But in general, I think as you say, the U.S. copyright guidance seems to me to be consolidating. You know the majority majority view, which is that IP laws that already exist were written to incentivize and to reward human invention. And, and the trend is that indeed humans can use AI, generative AI, as a tool for their own work, but they may need to start documenting how they are using it in such a way that these offices can evaluate whether this is something that you know ought to be copyrighted or trademarked or uh, or, or whatnot, or even patented, you know, uh, in, in some yeah, respect. So the human, the value of human element needs to be significant enough for it to, uh, to pass that test uh, in that sense. Okay, so uh, maybe just we have time for a couple of more uh, uh, smaller conversations. Uh, this I'm going to ask you on GDPR. So now uh, yeah. GDPR has been there. It's been there for eight years. Uh, and uh, it seems to suggest that it is perfectly ready for AI. So... Uh, now it has stuff like purpose limitation, data minim minimization, legitimate ground for processing, and all of that apparently can uh, work very well in an AI context. Now, is that something that the industry is naturally, uh, you know, um, able to relate to, or or do you think there there is there is there are bound to be areas of uh, gaps in terms of saying what we can do, what we cannot do, how do we apply some of these principles, which probably were not really thought through in a, in a very AI specific context, specifically like at least generative AI context. Uh, again, uh, let's see if you have a quick view on this. Absolutely. Look, there's many ways to analyze that question, but I think the one that for me is the most practical is to recognize that in the absence of a clear regulator that is specific to AI, there is no question that the data protection authorities have put their hand up and they believe themselves to be the best placed to give opinions on whether AI is being appropriately designed and deployed or not. And the reason for their belief is that they are in the data business. Uh, they are in the personal data business. And we know that all kinds of data, but a lot of publicly available data in the case of you know, these foundation models uh, is implicated. And so if, you know, data protection authorities think of themselves as data regulators, then it is logical. And we know, particularly in Europe, that because we have many percent of global turnover as a threat, companies will take it seriously and listen. So we saw the case in Italy, where the Italian authority very quickly said no to chat GPT in Italy, uh, because we think there are GDPR problems with it. Not the perfect law to apply to ChatGPT doesn't address all the issues, but it was enough for a regulator to block it. In the same way that if we go to, you know, if we think about Russia, Roskomajur in Russia has the authority to block certain, you know, software from being used, and they can just all they need is the hook. 
So the Data Protection Authority can be used as the hook that a broader government ecosystem wants to stop something. We've already seen that the Data Protection Acts let them do that if they want to stop it or slow it down. But on substance, if you look at, and indeed, the I think it was the CEO of ChatGPT got on a plane and flew to Rome and did a negotiation with the authority, and within a week or so, it was back up. And there was a statement given about how they resolved their issues. And, and the initial issues were around legal basis and whether you needed consent or legitimate interest, whether it was sufficiently transparent about what it was doing with data and whether there were any user rights associated with the data that had been used to train the system. Um, and also the, the treatment of children was something that the, the regulator raised. And when they resolved all of these issues in just one week, by agreeing to put a note saying it's not for children under the age of 13 and uh, it's uh, here is the transparency and we'll give you a privacy policy properly. And uh, the regulator actually was softer on legal basis than initially people thought. People thought the regulator was going to require consent, which would doom the product. But in fact, the regulator was a little bit quieter about, you know, perhaps legitimate interests could be appropriate for public publicly available searching that was not for its primary purpose designed to collect personal data, but rather its primary purpose was something different. Yeah, I think it's very interesting, uh, you know, and we have seen this in GDPR even earlier, when you think of cross-border data flows, uh, uh, you're trying to apply a legal lens to it, but uh, uh, so for example, uh, in the standard contractual clauses, uh, I think it's a similar kind of a situation. Uh, uh, you have an option to go very hard on it, or you can go soft on it, and 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 I think that's where both the legal and the economic realities need to kind of somewhere interact uh, for you to decide what what is it that you want to do, uh, and both the options are available to you as a as a regulator, and I think that's going to be interesting, and 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 I think from an Indian perspective, uh, we did an assessment of the Indian Data Protection Bill, uh, and and at least in our understanding, it comes through in, on a lot of these stuff when we think of uh, you know uh, uh, implementation of AI model and all of that. I think one of the areas which was interesting where we don't have a, a legitimate interest ground in our bill, uh, but we do have something like a deemed consent or reasonable purpose. And, and even that uh, I think in some way is evolving in the bill as it is getting finalized. So one of the things that uh, at least we uh, have been discussing is to say that how can you make sure that uh, some clarity is there in the law itself to say that when there is a publicly available data uh, that can be processed by AI systems? And it will be interesting to see because what we also realize is that a lot of websites, even when uh, they have publicly available personal data, in their terms and conditions actually restrict systems from scraping data. And, 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 and what impact do these things have is something that uh, will uh, need to uh, kind of uh, play out. Okay, I think uh, we are pretty much uh, uh, on time on this. And, and but uh, Justin, it's great uh, uh, catching up with you uh, and getting this perspective on on AI regulation as you see it. And and of course, we are going to be tracking the developments very closely. Uh, so uh, let's keep this conversation going. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Ashish. It was a pleasure, and I was glad. I'm glad to have the chance to talk to you again. Great. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And do watch out for the details of the third episode as we bring up another session on a deep dive with experts. Thank you and bye-bye. On tech and leadership, subscribe to NASCOM YouTube channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update.